Let's see. Uh, oh, actually it works. Uh, anyway, it's really nice to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, OK, I'm going to try to keep this fairly short in terms of the PowerPoint, but there's going to be a lot of stories. And then if you have questions, we can talk about them later. But uh, my whole adventure into this, uh, this realm of economic mobility came because uh, my mother was a single mom, Latina, from Mexico. Uh, came up with two kids, wanted a better life with her, for her two kids. My sister got in with the wrong kids. She was much older than me. Um, her life went askew. My mother was pretty devastated that she lost one of her kids in, in the land of opportunity. She focused on me. You're going to go to college. She got me through it, but she gave up her health, and I lost her in my mid-20s. So by this time now, I've lost my mother. I've, my sister's life screwed up. She has three kids. They're all screwed up. But I went through UC Berkeley in engineering school, and I entered another world. I entered this world. And uh, coming out of Berkeley, it's kind of amazing. All of a sudden, people think you're smart. And, <laughs> and you know, to me, it was like, I don't know. And so I'm a little skeptical about all of us, OK? So, <laughs> so I'm there, and um, you know, I did what my mother said, which is I had to become an engineer to earn money uh, to support the family and take care of my sister and her kids. Um, but um, after I lost my mother, that I really felt that something was wrong. Um, somehow or other, this country, you know, the, the reason we came, it was the land of opportunity, and if you worked really hard, you should be able to make it. And I can tell you, my mother and the people we knew worked really hard. And it just didn't seem to be happening. The war on poverty was going on, and so I joined the war on poverty. I ran a nonprofit uh, development corporation. We were considered one of the best in the country. I got invited to Clinton's 99 State of the Union address. And by the time I got invited in 99, I'm over there. This can't be good. Because I was seeing, I trained you know, young, young men and, and young women to get out of gangs. And what I was seeing now is their kids showing up in my program. Okay, so this is like 15 years into this work. And I'm over there. That wasn't what my mother wanted. She didn't want that one kid gets out. She wanted both kids to get out. But I wasn't seeing that happening with the families. And so I started questioning my work. And then at the same time, I was getting all these accolades, right? And now I'm going through another period like that. So it was kind of strange for me to go there. And I was very skeptical when I was with Clinton and the other folks that were there. And about three months after the State of the Union address, I got a call from Jerry Brown, who was then mayor of Oakland. And he called me, and he's pissed. So he calls me at, he's kind of interesting. He's really interesting. He calls me at 7 o'clock during dinner, right? And I'm on a board of the private industry council that's going to get $10 million for youth programs in Oakland. Most mayors would be really happy to see $10 million come in. He's upset. And he's over there, you know, look at the proposal. and. Aren't you guys just poverty pimping? Because in the proposal, in order to spend $10.2 million, we're going to hire 120 professional social workers, case managers, employment specialists, et cetera, et cetera. Then you go to the results page. And what we're going to do is enroll 80% of the toughest kids in Oakland. And what we hope happens is that they get jobs and that maybe they don't get into jail, et cetera, et cetera. I'm over, oh, shit. So you're going, to have this, you're, you're going to have this argument with Jerry Brown, right? And by this time, I'm already skeptical. You know, If my service is considered some of the best, then I'm talking really fast because there's a clock running. <laughs> and we've been running a little behind. Anyway, so, uh, so I have to um, look at the proposal. And he tells me to call him back, right? And you can tell he's upset. I call him back. He says, he did say, you know, isn't this poverty pimping? And for those of you who don't know, uh, when the war on poverty first started, the Black Panthers came onto campus in Berkeley and basically said that all of you guys are just going to get jobs. The money should go to us. We're going to take care of our own families and kids. And you guys are just going to be a bunch of poverty pimps. Now I'm like 30 years later, you know, having a job for 20 years and not seeing the kind of results, you know. So, um, so I had an argument with Jerry about whose fault it was, that why the war on poverty wasn't impacting anything. And then he stopped the argument. And this is what changed everything. He said, look it, if you could do anything you wanted to do, money wasn't a problem, regulations, anything, and you wanted to really impact poverty, what would you do? And by impact poverty, it was like, I, look, ah, I looked at what I would do, right? How did my mother look at, at impacting poverty? So um, he says, think about that, and you show up at my office next month and show me what to do, OK? Now, that was a great gift. To all of a sudden not have a box, to just be able to think really freely is something I'd never had because I grew up really poor. And so for two weeks, I went through everything, our, our history. I ran nonprofits. I knew all my friends. And finally came to the conclusion I didn't know. But I had an appointment with Jerry. 
So <laughs> I'm sitting in his office, right? And he walks in, and, he's, and he looks at me, and he's a little kinder this time. He just looks at me, so what would you do? You know, and, uh, and I told him, well, to be honest with you, I don't know what I would do, but my mother figured out what to do to get me out. So for that fact, I think most mothers and fathers would have a better idea how to get their own families and kids out. So I'd take some of this money you say we spend on ourselves, I'd set it aside. I, have a, I was an engineer. I have a data, I like data. I have a data tracking system that will tell us what families do to get their own lives together, and we're bound to learn something from that. There's no outcomes promised, no nothing promised. All we're going to do is learn from the families, and I have a data system. And he thought that was cool. He's the only person in the country probably would have. And so he threw his weight behind it. He got me funded. He gave me a commission that had the head of state social services for the state of California. Uh, it was pretty amazing. And so what we were going to do is learn from families. And that is what this project's about. I'm going to take you back into some of what we've learned. So we started in 2001. We engaged a bunch. Oh, there's one more, one more part of the story. Otherwise, it won't make sense, which is um, what I told Jerry is that in order for us to understand what families do, my staff, no staff will interfere. If my staff does any counseling or directing families at all, I would fire them. And we've already fired four staff that couldn't keep their mouth shut. But we, in order for, for people to help, one, to help themselves, they need somebody. And the way it used to work in this country was really how these townships were built, which everybody helped one another. It's that mutuality that was really important. So I told them, I'm only going to enroll families in groups with their friends. Okay? And we're going to learn from that group, because that's the, also the only way it's going to scale. This is not about individuals or individual families. So in terms of some of what we learned is that if this is the population group in our country, and it is, that... The largest part, 50% of the families are below this black line, 50% are over there, and obviously the incomes go way off the scale on the other end. But everybody's piled up here near poverty level, which is the red line. And that what we have lost is the ability to move in this direction, that mobility, right? But we do have a safety net system. And the safety net was important because my sister would get beat up by her husband all the time. And she would try to take her life, and you know, she needed mental health counseling, and she needed the safety net. Okay? So it was really important. But as soon as she stabilized and got a job, she'd start losing her child care, she'd start losing everything else. So she'd go back to this guy. You know, he'd beat her up again. So the safety net played a role, but obviously something was wrong with it. And one of the big things that my mother would not go into welfare, and if she had, maybe she'd still be alive because at least she would have gotten health care. So one of the things is that she wouldn't go there because she would basically say she'd lose my respect. You know, this issue of pride is really what drove her. And she didn't want this issue of dependency. And even if it were nice people, she said the social worker, you know, was really nice. The right-wing guy that called her lazy and Mexican and, and whatever, she didn't care about that guy. But the social worker was really nice, but it was really hard to be critical of her uh, because she was being so nice. But basically it was disempowering for my mother. The other thing that the data is now showing is that what we've done is we have a lot of people and we push them to get above the poverty line. And when we talk about poverty, we normally talk about getting above the poverty line. And so most of the social programs will claim success. And they are successful. The dilemma is that after three years, 30% of some part of that family is right back under, which was my sister. And after five years, 50%. So all we're doing is we, we have this cycle going on. And that's not, again, what my mother really wanted. So the issue is, can we move people further across back into here? And that's the system we don't have, because what we have is a system based on need, not based on what my mother needed. Was She wanted people to recognize that she was talented. She was a designer. She would love to have had a business. She worked really hard, et cetera. There was a benefit system. When I became middle income, I was an engineer. That I, and actually, I just got a MacArthur Award. And so they're giving me all this money. And so now I got a financial planner. And so, <laughs> so she's, she's explaining to me what are all my options over here. And God, man, there's, there's options, right? <laughs> well, so, so we have a system here and we have a system there. And what I'm learning from the families is they work really hard. They get above the poverty level, which what everybody says, you know, even not being in the programs, only 10% go through the programs. And then they end up in this, this gap, 
we have almost nothing there that recognizes talent, that recognizes initiative. You know, we treat people in that area, which is my, my mother, working poor, as if they were crisis cases. You know, and, and to treat them that way is disrespectful. So what FII, my project, is about is about building, bridging this thing, building what we call an opportunity platform. And we're testing resources that families can access based on their initiative, based on what they do to really try to get their own lives together. Remember the conversation with Jerry Brown. We're going to learn what families do on their own without any direction from us, right? So what we've learned is that there are a bunch of things that we can do. And I'm saying we, it's we. We could actually do that should be made available not when my sister got beat up, but when my sister got a job and was trying to work. So that's what we really need. So that's what we've been exp um, exploring. I'm not going to stay very long on here. There's uh, people want the PowerPoint. I can give them. We're experimenting. Some of these things like Kiva, Kiva and Kiva Zip, I think, uh, are being looked at. There's some people here from there. There's some other benefits that are available based on initiative. Um, individual development accounts, matching uh, awards, all of the stuff that worked for us. When I became middle income, I was given awards, I just got given a fellowship, uh, I, I got encouraged. Um, all of these things were based on people thought I was smart because I came out of Berkeley or something like that. Well, you know, the fact is, <laughs> I wasn't all that smart. Bridges would have fallen down, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but, but, well, it was my mother told me I had to be a doctor and engineer. Well, we won't spend time on that. Anyway, so we're exploring a bunch of different things that the, over the 10 years that this project has been going is like, so what do you need? And what I can tell you is that what families need varies by family, by individual in the family, by community, by whether you're in the city of San Francisco or you're in Oakland, totally different economies. It varies all over the place. Actually, it varies to the same extent that all of your aspirations, all of your needs, all of your talents are varied. Low-income folks are just like all the rest of us. They just have less money, and they have less chance of getting the things that they need when they need them. We go after things when we need them, when our kids need them. So what happens, we go after college, whatever. And because we have the money, the service system really is there to serve us. You know, we're constantly being surveyed. I don't know how many surveys you get. I got two just you know, from the hotels and stuff that I, I just went to. Basically, the market system right now surveys us and they try to keep up with what we want and then they try to cater to us as consumers. Low-income families are not treated that way. And yet, we have technology that we can survey. We, there's big data. We can actually get the information that we need from low-income families to know what is it they need to get their own lives together. So if anything, technology, and I'll go into that a little bit, technology is a huge help at this point in time and it actually can be made available to low-income families. So what's different is people think that we're attacking the safety net sometimes, and, and we're not. You know, I, like I said, when my sister got beat up, we need that. But the way it is set up, it is really only for people in crisis. As soon as somebody stabilizes, there has to be a different system, which is the system you and I want to access. We, we feel entitled to have things really available for us when and if we want them. And that's what this side is, okay? So that's what we've been building at this point in time. Here's some of the outcomes, and I'm going to get a bottle of water. You can, I'm not going to read this stuff to you. So the fact is that consistently over the 10 years that we did a project in Hawaii because it was very different cultures. We started in Oakland, San Francisco, Boston. In Boston, actually the average household income, we just finished two years with the families in Boston, household income jumped 26%. They have come up, the families there have come up with the most innovative things. And like I said, it's what they've come up with. Because if my staff had anything to do with it, they'd be fired. Actually, we fired somebody there. <laughs> um, well, what's interesting is when you do that, the families realize, the fa a lot of families have been programmed to wait for the professional to give them direction. We've just have programmed people that way. And all this innovation that you guys are exploring we, you know, the nonprofits are basically telling the families to wait till you guys come up with ideas. Well, that's not a good thing. You know, the fact is the best innovations I've seen are what have come out of these families. And some of the, some of the most fascinating things that's all. Yeah, an example is, uh, a couple of examples. One is the families in San Francisco, 
uh, started doing lending pools, right, which is very traditional. And it was their way of addressing predatory lenders. And, you know, they know. You know, what our sector does is we're going to train people because they must be dumb, and we have to train them and tell them that predatory lenders are bad. And that's how a lot of the training is done. You know, it has that kind of attitude towards it. The fact is they know that. You give them an alternative, they'll go to the alternative. But the other thing is they try developing their own. And what ended up happening is then the Boston families heard that the San Francisco families were doing these lending circles. And they said, well, that's what we used to do in, in El Salvador and in Colombia. And, 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 you know. and so then they started doing them. And then African-American groups, remember, they're all in groups with their friends. They start doing lending circles. In Boston, then we got one group that started with three families out of FII. They now have 66 members. They're putting in 200 a month. And um, they right now accumulate the equivalent of, a half of, of $200,000 in a year. They're starting to use that pool to buy up businesses, to create jobs for themselves. Those are the kinds of things. And so now all of these other families, because this is all kind of <laughs> social networking, uh, let me come back to that. All these other families then start paying attention. When a professional comes in and says, look it, best thing for you, take some financial training and you need to work on your kids and what is it, and you know, the, the social worker said, what is it you want and you know, very nicely. Um, the fact is that what we do is we go and we get a group of families and we say, look, there's been at this point a 47 year war on poverty, it hasn't worked. Really smart people with a lot of money. Uh, oh, and <laughs> really smart people with a lot of money and that it's, the solution's gonna be up to you. And so what ends up happening is what's called positive deviance. Somebody does something extraordinary. One Salvadoran family bought a house. Next thing you knew, within a year and a half, all the other Salvadoran families have bought a house, something that they never even considered. So that, that was kind of it. Again, it harkens back to this. The data piece is really huge for us. So we spend a lot of time. We're basically having it cloud-based at this point in time. One of the biggest change factors is the families, every month when they log on to tell us what they've done over that month, because again, we're serving them, they see what they've done. So they see their, their income going up, they see their debt going down. And for them, it's a, a way to focus and to really reinforce what they're doing. Mauricio, yeah. I, I hate to do this, we have to move on, but I want to ask you a question first. And before I ask the question, I want to point something out. Mauricio made this sort of offhanded comment about his little MacArthur award. The, the way he did that, sort of like calling the Nobel Prize Miss Congeniality. I mean, this was, this was a, a MacArthur Genius Award. I could have explained a lot of other uh, yeah, things besides this. <laughs> exactly. But I wanted to ask one question for a, a quick answer. It's, it's, it's powerful what you're doing. So many uh, uh, of the models we've seen in history, uh, some of them are rising today, like micro-lending in many countries, the social groups that provide the support and the encouragement. Um, what's one thing that the public can do? What's one thing that any of us can do to become involved in this kind of a dynamic, to support what you're doing, to support what other groups are doing, uh, to apply these insights? Um, some of this you're not going to like which is that um, in trying to be really helpful in vulnerable communities, you basically displace the talent that's already there. So um, it's really hard to tell people that are, wanna be active and have ideas, and I just did, there was a class at UC Berkeley and the 24-year-old social worker that, you know, getting her MSW said she was depressed at the end. The fact is that uh, it isn't that we don't have a role, our role needs to follow demand. It, it is really a business model. Mm. So if you treat people as consumers and you really try to meet their demand, and if they don't need you, I'm sorry, your ideas, you know, you know, but the thing is that with low income communities, all our ideas will look good. You know, there'll always be somebody because there just isn't enough, but we don't have a demand driven system. So I think what we need to do is start really engaging families. You never see families at these kinds of things. You know, they really need to start taking the lead. Great. Mauricio, thank you so much. Thank you.